I don't know what if I should call you Shaky or Alejandro for the purposes of this interview. I'm quickly it's, it's definitely, yeah, it's right. your choice. So, Alejandro, you were born and raised in Austin. I was. I have seen you play a bunch of places, too many to count, around this town. Mm -hmm. but that's the first time I've seen you out on that stage in front of our cameras. Yeah. The real deal tonight. How'd it feel for you? It felt, uh, I feel like relieving is the word. <laughs> I, but I felt very, like, uh, um, I don't know. It, it, I usually, uh, I feel like I usually don't linger or feel as comfortable um, just standing on a stage. And that stage kind of uh, pulled that out of me to a certain degree. Like I've never just like stood and like, stared around and been like, you know, not like, come on, <laughs> you know, not gladiator style, but, but uh, you know, it means a lot to me. It really does. It means a lot on a, on a lot of different levels. It means a lot. Um, because of who's in the audience, it means a lot. Because of who's behind the cameras and what's behind all of this, as far as you know, legacy and just uh, you know, career stuff. Like even just like job. Like I'm like, oh my god, I have a job. You know, I'm a musician with a job that allows me to do things and participate in stuff. Um, and then also, I you know, I'm, it's crazy uh, hearing words come out of my mouth that I've written that other people care about more than I do, maybe. And. Uh, that creates a perfect storm of relief <laughs> to release, you know. I mean, I guess the, the strange part about, you know, what you want to be when you grow up and then what you are when you're, am I grown up? I don't know. I'm, <laughs> I don't, That's I'm a not, lifetime a process. <laughs> yeah, you're not a grown up still. Yeah. No way. No way. So, yeah, I don't know. Like, uh, I don't know what I want to be when I grow up. But, uh, but I've always known that I, I want to be, um, on stage and it doesn't matter how big or small you know I grew up in theaters and I mean even your career like Tinez has known me Tinez the lighting guy has known me since I was like this big because him and my father used to uh, do the Paramount together oh I didn't know that yeah so I saw Tina when I walked in I was like Tinez <laughs> and he's like hey who's used to get you on my knee you know what's up I was like Tinez this is Tinez is doing this like <laughs> you know it's like that's very uh, again it's just super close to the chest and and um, just the smells of production and gaff tape and <laughs> the smells of gaff tape. Yeah. Really, I've always said you can't act in your for yourself in your own bedroom. Like it, there's a there's a level of expression that I always wanted to achieve, and also kind of transcendence or whatever. The reason acting is really enjoyable is that you can step outside of yourself and still, um, you know, convey deep emotion and and put yourself in something that doesn't really have to do with yourself. And music is. Um, can be the same thing, you know, if you, depending on how you choose to write or sing or, or perform, you know, you, the audience gives you a chance to become whatever it is you want to be in front of them. And um, that's a huge privilege and it's combined with the fact that, you know, you can be saying stuff that's very personally important. You know, if I, if I was acting on a stage like this, I might be reading someone else's lines, you know, unless I wrote the play, did the blah, 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 you know, like did the whole thing myself. There's not the same sort of fulfillment um, or artistic kind of danger to it. I guess there's a fine line there because if you're on a stage singing a song that you wrote and basically pouring out your heart and soul to a room full of mostly strangers, well, not to mention it's you. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you're not, it's not really an act, but in a way it is. Yeah, well, I mean, that's the beautiful thing about songs, I guess, is that it's obviously me. You know, it's like my voice and, and it came from me. But it's just as, you know, I've never murdered anybody or been put in an electric chair or, you know, anything like that. And, and I can still sing that song with absolute um, truth because uh, I know what I'm talking about and other people seem, seem to, it re resonates in the same sense. You know, it's like you don't have to die to... to talk about the story of being dead, that kind of thing, or, or you know, you don't have to be in love to, to hear a song about being in love, and uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a huge privilege to have people follow you where you take them with songs, it's really crazy. Well, you genuinely seem to be having fun, having a good time when you're out there <laughs> yeah. on stage. I was going to say, it's almost like you're playing to a room full of family and friends, but uh, tonight actually you were <laughs> hmm. almost playing to a room full of <laughs> yeah. family and friends. But you seem to have a very natural rapport, and I think that's something that the people in the audience 
obviously respond to. They feel very comfortable with you, much the same as you do with them. Yeah, I hope so. Well, I really wanted to walk into this and, and have that be the show. You know, I, I thought about it a lot, and, and I didn't think about it a lot, kind of on purpose, too, where um, I didn't want to come in here and uh, sell an album or, or promote anything specifically. You know, I, I feel like uh, I wanted to freeze frame sort of who I am right now because, you know, this archive will last longer than anything I really have, you know, as far as, like, my shoebox of photos in my house and that kind of stuff. So for me, it's just as important. It's, it puts a time stamp on where I am as a person and as a musician. And, you know, I may look back on this as the peak or I might look back on this as the valley or, you know, it doesn't really matter. But I'm just excited to even have, a, have an opportunity. Your name isn't Shaky Graves. No. Where is the name? Where does Shaky Graves come from? So Shaky Graves, um, I had always wanted to, again, with the music thing, like I, I uh, coming from acting, I didn't, again, I did, really didn't want to promote. I didn't want to use my music as like the Alejandro Rose Garcia experience. Like, welcome to Alejandro Rose Garcia. I'm here to, you know, talk to you about my life. Like, it's not therapy. You know, I, I wanted to write music that, that was bigger than that. And, um, and I read an interview with Jeff Buckley where right after Grace had come out, he wanted to go on a, uh, he went on a coffee shop tour where he changed his name every night. So he would go as, you know, fairies in the dust or like, I mean, I read this long list of aliases that he had. And so for one a couple months or whatever, a bunch of people saw Jeff Buckley play in coffee shops and, you know, they had no idea what it was, but it was obviously still Jeff Buckley singing beautiful music to people. And I thought that there was something about that that was really genuine and, and, uh, and important. And so I went on a quest kind of for, a, for an alias. And um, I was at Old Settlers Music Festival in 2007. And we were hanging out near a fire and, you know, drinking Lone Star and whatever. And um, this guy came up to our camp and he was, he was definitely like tripping on probably LSD. And he was like in the, in the zone and he had a big warm beer in his hands, like a big old Miller High Life. And he's, you know, like coming in and talking all this weird stuff. And he's referring to his whiskey. He's like, this is the best whiskey in the world. So this is my favorite. This whiskey is so good. He's like, try, try this whiskey. And we'd all kind of like, oh, yeah, that's, that's good whiskey. He's like, I'm telling you, man, this is the best whiskey. And, and went through this whole thing. And, you know, he was harmless. And at the end, he's like, all right, well, I'm, you good people. You're good people. I will see you later. Watch out for spooky wagons. And we're like, what? Did you hear him say spooky whack? Was that the last thing we heard this guy say? Like spooky wagons. And we figured that that would be a really cool like Nashville guitar picker name, kind of like Speedy <laughs> West or something, you know? Like spooky wagons, like W A G G I N S. Like, spooky wagons. And so we all came up with names, and uh, uh, there was Spinster Jones and Spooky Wagons and Solomon Doors, which is one of my favorites. And. Um, uh, I was Shaky Graves, and then <laughs> my friend's little brother was asleep when we were doing this, and we were cooking hot dogs, and so we named him Droopy Wieners. And he, <laughs> and he woke up and was has, has since become probably the most famous of all of us. People at, at any show I go to, oh, where's, where's Droopy Wieners? <laughs> and I'm like, he's hanging around. Boom. <laughs> uh, I've never heard the whole story before, so that's, <laughs> that's great. You know, I grew up drawing and just, just essentially learning how to create uh, like art pieces, just making stuff. I was, I've always been very compulsively makey stuff. So when I started making music, I immediately started recording and multi-tracking. And so then I would always hit this wall, which I still do, is where I'll build a song that I can't play by myself. And then I'm also very picky about um, just the way things are conveyed or the way it sounds. So at the time, I didn't really have the propensity to put a band together efficiently. Like I didn't have, I didn't find anybody that I would start to play a song and they'd take off into, you know, like a rock swing thing and I would be like, well, it's not, you know, it's not my, my thing. So I would have, I would build a song that I found, found very precious and then I would try and play it in front of people with an acoustic guitar and it would not, it wouldn't translate. And um, I went to Emo's, old Emo's, and saw three one-man bands in a row, they were all in a bill together. And it was this guy possessed by Paul James and um, dude, uh, Scott Byram and um, a guy named Bob Log III. And so they, they, I watched three guys all do different 
one man bands. And there's a, there's a level of novelty act to you know one man bands in general, but they all had a totally different approach to it. And I learned something kind of from each one of them. And the thing that I really took away is that you can that percussion is is uh, essential. You know, especially as an attention getting device, because at that point I was just playing in loud talky bars. And I mean, the most beautiful songwriter could walk into a bar that I'm drinking at or something like that and start playing. And I, I you know, not, like just because you have an acoustic guitar doesn't give you the privilege of anything. You know, it doesn't really matter. But that drum inherently makes people turn their heads and focus. And so I believed in my content. And I, you know, it was kind of the idea of if I can get people to give me a chance, then I can stop them, you know? And so the drum allowed me to do that. And uh, I started on a kick drum and a hi-hat, but I didn't own a drum kit and I didn't have a car and I would have to bum everything from all my friends and you know, people who were out there tonight. And um, eventually a situation came up where uh, I had been thinking about building a luggage, something that I could walk around with a guitar and a drum thing and unfold it and blah, blah, blah and, and make as much noise as I humanly could. And um, <laughs> and that wish like came through in spades, you know, and uh, and it became sort of a trademark that I didn't particularly intend to um, to do. But past that, it's become something that I think, s with certain songs, it really is the only percussion it needs. You know, I, I don't really enjoy, there's certain songs that that's how it's supposed to sound. It turns out, and uh, it's only through flexibility and curiosity that I ever even found that out. I want to end by just reading a quote from your interview with Kevin Curtin in the Chronicle story a few months ago, where you're talking about your sense of reality, <laughs> which I think goes to your philosophy in general about, about life and your music, yeah. where you said, there's a close layer between reality and what runs alongside reality. Mm. Yeah. What does that mean? <laughs> Elaborate. It's a, a great question. Um, Yeah, I, I. I mean, life unfolds in new ways every day. You don't know what the, the next day or next year yeah, is it's, going to bring. It's more of a sense of. Um, there's certain times where I feel like I'm on the path, and uh, or I'm in the zone, and um, I'm not sure exactly what that means, and I know that a lot of people describe the same thing you know, be it athletes or writers or um, I mean, anybody, really. You know, even just if you're having a really good day where you show up and you, you know, you hit a green light and then someone, blah, and then you do this and you happen to miss that and you show up right before someone gives you a parking ticket and, you know, whatever, any of that stuff. And um, part of me believes that there's ways to uh, hone into that or to listen to whatever that is, or to explain parts of it. And, um, and that thing runs right alongside like daily boring life, you know? And uh, sometimes it's really weird and scary. Like I, I happened to be around and saw a guy, uh, it's kind of somber, but I saw a guy die two, three days ago. Saw somebody get hit by a car. And uh, it, was the, it was one of the most surreal parts of a day, you know? Like it was just one of these like, why, <laughs> why was I, happened to be like I'm gonna go to the bank at midnight and run down the road and cross this thing and then it was like watching this and the strangers that were around me and it was a full moon and you know it's just like all this nonsense that somehow seemed relevant and uh, and decoding that is kind of the enjoyable part of trying to write music for me is trying to convey that that strange it's strange. Well, sometimes being in the zone can be very comforting and reassuring, but other times it can feel like you're in a box. Right. <laughs> you don't want that. No. No. It's, uh, it's staying, staying curious. You know, staying in the river, I guess, is the best metaphor for it. You know, that it's, it's flowing somewhere, I guess. Well, you're in the river right now. You don't know where it's flowing. <laughs> I feel like it. I, I truly Sometimes do. it feels like you're in the rapids. Too, I, yeah, but, it, you know? There are plenty of rapids in this river. I, I guarantee it. Well, look, man, enjoy the ride. Thank you, Terry. Real th honor. Thanks for, for coming. It's been, yeah. it's been a great night. So. Thank you. <laughs>